splits, subluxations, and slow appetites today. Quote for this morning is this, success is not to be pursued, it is to be attracted by the person that you become. So very similar to last week about the habits of the person that you um, eventually become. <laughs> so everything that you do eventually defines you. Then the next step is that once you become that person, then success is a byproduct rather than something that you have to pursue in and of itself. So today we have some great questions from you guys. Thank you. Splits, subluxations and slow appetites. Um, so I'm going to run through them and anything you have as we go along, then let me know. Um, speaking of which, before we start, top tip pressure cooker. I've just had some beef red wine mushroom stew that was pressure cooked last night. And oh my God, I cannot recommend getting a pressure cooker enough. It can turn a cheap cut of meat into like fall off the bone meat. You can put a whole roast chicken in there. You can put cheap bits of beef or whatever. And it just, it's lovely. And the pressure like seals the flavor into the food as well. Put a couple of sprigs of rosemary and it's just like, it tastes of rosemary all the way through. Um, some smoked garlic, all that stuff. And it's lovely. And if you know me, you'll know that I cannot cook. And so to be able to just bung stuff into a machine and not worry about it is lovely. So yeah, I got the instant pot. That was thanks to someone who recommended it on Instagram to us because uh, my old rice cooker broke. So yeah, definitely recommend the instant pot. Okay. So we have a question from Ollie, which is, what's your tip or exercise for the middle splits, that is side splits, in addition to Emmett Louis' uh, splits exercises? So for anyone that doesn't know, um, first of all, I should say, check out the stretching videos that we've done. Go to the members area and search stretching or just search in the, in the Facebook group. There's a whole bunch of stuff about the principles behind stretching and flexibility in general. Also look on the website for anything that we've done with Kit Lachlan. Um, so last week we posted an article that covered a summary of the retreat that we did with Kit Lachlan, so the two-day workshop, and that goes over really probably most the, the most comprehensive um, summary of the whole process. So definitely check that out. In fact, I'm going to send you the link because I am that kind of guy. Um, stretching workshop, propane fitness. There we are. So I'm going to post links in the comments for anything that's mentioned or referenced through here. Whoops, that had the search term in there as well. But anyway, so um, the Emmett Lewis approach is three sets. So you sit in a pancake, which is sitting on the floor, legs at right angles, and you do three sets of 20 leaning over on each side. So three sets of 20 leans to the left, three sets of 20 leans to the right, three sets of 20 to the middle. And the, the idea is you then get better at um, being able to use your own hamstrings to pull you in and out of that position. So this isn't to do with like pressing with your arms and kind of bouncing in and out of the stretch. It's using the muscle involved in the stretch to move in and out. And that way you get stronger at the movement, but also you're teaching your nervous system that you are strong enough to handle that position and at that range. And Emmett argues that Flexibility is simply strength at the end range of motion. He also recommends three sets of 20 sumo squats, and that can be done three times a week, I think, or twice a week. So that is simply barbell on your back, just like 30, 40 kilos, wide stance, and just, again, dropping into the squat, keeping your knees pushed out so that you're really stretching the adductors there. Now, um, there are some additional stuff you can do as well, but it really depends on why you're doing the splits. Is it because you want to do the splits because it's cool and it's an aesthetic movement? Or are you doing it for a certain thing? So if it is for something like doing flares on a pommel horse, then yeah, you will need some active flexibility. You'll need to be able to strengthen your abductors because they abduct your legs apart. That's how I remember it. Um, and so you'll need the, the strength to actually hold them in that position when you're not just relying on the floor to push you into that position. So also the next thing to, is to do is to look at your weakest link. For a lot of people, it is the hamstrings. And I'll explain that ridiculous photo in a second. Um, but also the hip flexors. So that's on the front. And um, people 
often overemphasize the the hamstrings as um, the, so if you're doing front splits, they overemphasize it as the most important thing because it, it feels the most stretch. But actually your back leg is doing a hell of a lot of work as well. And you need to make sure that that's not the thing that's limiting you and causing you to have to lean forward in the splits. For the side splits, the adductors are the main one. So that's a group of four different muscles, um, arguably five if you include um, sartorius as well, which go along the, the inside of your legs. And so... Um, Obviously, that's going to be the main one. You can do the Taylor's pose. Taylor's pose. Um, and I will include an image of that as well. Oh, look, it's Kit. First image that comes up. So this is the Taylor's pose. So you can do that with a partner as well, where the partner has their back to your back and they're resting their hands on your knees and leaning over and it's lovely just having that support of somebody and leaning strength or leaning pressure is very different to pressing pressure and you will feel that in yourself so if you have someone who's pressing with bent arms you're not going to feel as stable as if they've got straight arms and they're just completely leaning and resting their body weight over you so try that with a partner gracilis so this is one of the adductors and what can often happen is that the gracilis it's, it's a, I mean, it even sounds nasty, doesn't it? It's one of those muscles that can actually get tacked and stuck to your medial hamstring. That's the semi-membranosus, I think. Um, semi-membranosus semi -membranosis or semi-tendinosus. You're testing my anatomy now, but um, it basically gets stuck to that. And what you can do is actually untack it like this. So that is kit just moving through and untacking the chrysalis from somebody and uh, we did this at the workshop as well it's a pretty nasty um, sensation but you might find that if you do that and you so you start really close in to your crotch get your fingers in between that gap between the chrysalis and the hamstring you will feel like a v-shaped gap dig your fingers in there and then move along systematically trying to separate those two strings of muscle and once you get all the way closer to the knee it, by the way, you have to get someone else to do this on you, because if you try and do it to yourself, you will tense up. Um, once you've done that on both sides, some people actually gain quite a lot of range, and that's because now the muscles can move freely side by side. So give that a go. This is the link for anyone that wants to see the full video. And then the stuff from Kit specifically. So an interesting gender difference or sex difference in stretching is that men typically need to be able to support themselves in the position of the splits to be able to get into that position. So you need to, that's because men often rely on their strength to compensate for certain movements. Women, however, are more able to yield into the stretch and to relax into it. So bear that in mind. That simply means that for men, strength-based drills are more appropriate. And for women, relaxation-based drills are more appropriate. So that's it for um, splits tips. It's quite a simple thing, it's just not easy. <laughs> so to figure, figure out your weakest link, figure out why it is that you want to get the splits and, and direct your training accordingly, get strong in the end range of motion and learn to relax into the position as well and focus on or try out the adductors, the gracilis, the hamstrings and the hip flexor stretches figure out which is the biggest, weakest link for you, the major bottleneck, the limiting factor, and direct your efforts to that. Sophie asked, what is the best way to time your meals and training if you are intermittent fasting? So Sophie, you are lucky that we covered that last week. So check out Satiety 102 for how to time your, your meals in terms of intermittent fasting, and also managing diet in hotels and shift work challenges. So I actually cover um, timing your intermittent fasting as a whole and uh, that that's based around a 16-8 framework so the lean gains protocol essentially any questions so far so tiggy asked what to do when your appetite just isn't there i would say if you are dieting ride the wave you know you you're allowed to um enjoy the fact that you're not hungry. Still aim to try and hit your macro and your calorie targets, but um, it's not so much of a concern if you're trying to lose fat because that's exactly what you want. You don't want to be um, feeling starving all the time. However, if you're actually struggling to hit your targets, then look through the Satiety 102 
module that we did last week and reverse some of the tips. So go for low volume, high calorie foods, things like pizzas, burger, um, rice. Avoid things like boiled potato because you don't get much bang for buck if you're trying to gain weight and everything you eat is super filling. Vegetables as well are obviously extremely filling with very low calorie value. So um, you actually want to try and reduce the amount of vegetables that you're eating if you're trying to gain weight and you're really struggling to get the calories in. If you do that, you're going to have to have a multivitamin to counteract um, some of the potential deficiencies that you might accrue, especially if you're deliberately reducing your vegetable intake. Um, there's not many people I would say to do that, but um, you know, if, if you're losing weight and you're not trying to, then obviously that's a problem. If you are struggling with your appetite, increase your training volume. Often that can be the, the most powerful thing that you can do. And just either increasing the frequency or the volume of your training will ramp up your appetite. And sometimes actually your appetite is really just a signal or it's an indication of how hard you're training. And if you're not feeling hungry and you try and overeat, but you haven't really put the work in in the gym, that's bad news because that means you're going to um, just basically be accumulating fat rather than um, be eating in accordance with the stimulus that you're giving your body. <clears throat> and so if you're training hard, your body's going to be like, look, you're causing a lot of demands on me now. I need to recoup, eat more food. And then the whole system works without having to try and hack diet or, or hunger. Other things, there are some medical causes of reduced appetite. They're generally a bit um, more rare, but they are, you know, it's if you're really struggling with all of the stuff above, then obviously you want to get your thyroid checked, go to the GP, um, possibly B12 deficiency as well. Um, but that's that's really something to, to see somebody about specifically. And also just get lean. Um, the leaner you've been, the, the, the leaner you are, the, the, le the more hungry you are. And if you've ever been super shredded, you'll know that sense of deep, like insurmountable hunger that you get. It's like a black hole in your belly. And when that happens, you will have no problem with eating enough calories. You will have the opposite problem. Finally, drinking your calories. So this is something that we tell people in a fat loss diet never to do. But when you're struggling to gain weight, go for some smoothies, some shakes, add peanut butter to your drinks, get a blender basically, and you can have some great times. One of my favorites is pineapple, parma, violets, and fresh mint. That is a beautiful drink. <laughs> so give that a go. Um, don't bother with weight gain shakes. So, um, where, there we go. No weight gain shakes, um, because they're just overpriced and they taste like ass. So make your own is much, much nicer. Some whey, some peanut butter, some milk, maybe some yogurt, anything that you like, and you're gonna have a much nicer time and it'll be cheaper. So Tiggy, I hope that answers your question about what to do when your appetite just isn't there. Faye asks, how do you go about going to the gym without a personal trainer, knowing what exercises to do, what equipment to use, reps, sets, how to use the equipment by yourself? How do you create a gym program for yourself or someone else? And how do you know when to progress? Excellent questions, Faye. And that is why we created the propane protocol. All of those questions are addressed in a module of their own within our members area for people that have started the gym, not really sure where to go, um, and really to help them hit the ground running rather than kind of be faffing around in the gym. Like we spent the first, maybe the first two, three years of our training lives, just not knowing what we were doing, trying to train hard, but really having no direction. And we just span our wheels for far too long. It was only once we started following a training system and knowing the principles that govern the response to training in your body is when we started to be able to really make some progress with ourselves and help 2000 plus clients get in shape and um, avoid all the hassle for them too. So creating your own program, it has to be goal centered. So it has to actually be um, directed to what you actually, what you want to achieve. However, saying that most people will say, oh, I want to be healthier. Health is a very nebulous term. You need to define specifically what it is you want to have. And in 95% of cases, so unless someone is looking to only prioritize strength at the expense of anything else, doesn't care how they look, they're happy to get fat and they just want to get strong 
or something or something like that with just a pure performance goal outside of that 95 percent, especially of general public want they're really just a bodybuilder and you might be thinking well i'm not a bodybuilder i don't want to be one of them but the reality is bodybuilders simply want to gain muscle and they want to lose fat and so everybody has bodybuilding goals but they just don't realize it so everyone wants to tone up you know let's say you've got the the middle-aged woman who has the bingo wings and wants to turn them up that's a bodybuilding goal because you want to lose fat on your arm and gain some muscle just because you don't want to end up looking like um you know big big rami i'm going to send you a, a i'm going to include a picture of that um like this guy doesn't mean that we don't want to be we don't have bodybuilding goals so yeah obviously this guy ha he's wanted to gain muscle he's wanted to lose fat but he's done it to such an extreme and with so many exogenous hormones and steroids and insulin and all that that he ends up looking like that but at the same time you can um who's that my sister's calling i'm gonna put my phone on airplane mode um there's always some kind of technical problem isn't there um i'm trying to f i'm trying to find a picture of a woman that is in good shape but i don't know what to search for on google without um getting something that's a bit pornographic um i am going to leave that to your imagination i think <laughs> so um anyway the point that i was making is that you likely have a bodybuilding goal in some way and so you want to direct your training around lifting weights and eating a calorie deficit and then once you're as happy as you're uh, lean as you're happy with then you can start to increase your calories and gain some muscle while being as lean as possible the other thing is when you're designing a program you need to have structural balance so you don't accumulate shoulder injuries or postural instability from doing too much flexion based movements or too much extension um, or you know too much pressing and not enough pulling any of those kind of things now if you're not sure how to do that obviously you want to go to a coach who has experience with that otherwise you can end up setting yourself up for injury the other question you asked Faye is how do I track progress so with training the three metrics we use are weight reps and volume and so if you're increasing the weight that you're doing each week if you're doing more reps or if you're doing more total volume and volume is simply weight time weight times reps times sets per session then you are making progress and there's no need to worry about that as for how do i know whether i'm doing the right thing in the gym make use of this group you know we always encourage people to send us technique videos in the group and people will uh, we as the coaches and, and other members will give you some tips on how to improve them um and when your technique is as mechanical and replicable as possible then you know that when you're improving the weight each week that is down to strength gain and you getting better as a person rather than mechanical advantages or like changing the mechanics of the movement and somehow getting better like that problem is from this pressure cooker meal i've got the hiccups now um and then tracking your diet progress is simply a case of measurements photos and weight measurements are done every six weeks Photos are done weekly, same lighting, same position, same angle. And then weight, whoops, weight is done morning, every morning, naked, post toilet, pre breakfast. And I think you asked a question a few weeks ago, Faye, about being worried about weight particularly and that, um, feeling anxious about the changes in your weight remember it's just one of three metrics and we want to take everything into context so if you're worried about weight and it, it gets on you it you know it invades your thought patterns just weigh in hand it over to the coaches forget about it it's only one metric of your whole thing and as we said a few weeks ago if you gained weight but you looked better in your photos your measurements were improving your waist measurement went down your um, shoulders and your arms and your, your thighs went up for example or um, or all of the, the the problem areas went down but your weight stayed the same that's progress so let's not attach things too much to body weight got a couple of comments 
Lorita says, the truth is, I feel I'm not strong enough to do handstands for long or Olympic lifts because my upper body is rubbish. So, Yusuf, there is no need to change the exercises as long as there is progressive overload. Um, so I, I do get to your question in a second, Lorita. We, we, yeah, we'll, I'll cover that in a second. Hazel says, that's me constantly hungry. <laughs> yeah, so that's definitely the, uh, the, mo the more common problem. And I had the same thing when I was super, super lean in 2013. Um, you know, like pancreas lean for a competition. All you can think of is food. And it's a really miserable existence. And it, becomes, it gets to the point where you can't go out for a meal with friends without like just being twitchy, essentially, with all of the, the food that's available there. So uh, I remember people left bits of crust of their pizza on the, on the plate. And I'm looking over thinking like, I could just clear up this restaurant and there'd be no problem. So Hazel says, yeah, that's where I need help. Hazel, definitely go back and check the Satiety 102 uh, video from last week. It will completely solve your problems and it's something that I'm hoping to be make into more of a research interest as a whole for me um, in my medical career and uh, just because it's it's one of the most um, overlooked aspects of dieting and it's the key determinant to success. Right, next question is Lorita. So she was asking how can we get stronger quicker and uh, she said just before um, that she's not strong enough to do handstands for long or Olympic lifts. Um, so is there no change, no need to change the exercises as long as there is progressive overload? So good question. Um, now let's switch to the slides. The first thing is a time machine. That is the most important thing that you need for um, getting stronger quicker. But uh, the other one is tracking progress. So if you don't have a time machine available, then we need to start looking for the small wins and seeing where it is that we are progressing. So whether it's reps, sets, or load, or uh, reps, volume, or, or load. So go back to this to track progress. Remember these three. And if you don't have an app or you want something to, to track it more accurately, I cannot recommend the app called Heavyset enough. That is an app that I use for iPhone. Um, if you go to this website, you can download it. Um, and it gives you this kind of interface with your training. Look at that. Beautiful. So you can see over the months, over the years, whether your total volume has generally gone up. And if that's the case, you know that you are getting stronger and um, you're gaining muscle from month to month. Also enjoy the process. And I think tracking is a great way to help you enjoy the process because then you can start to look at these small wins. Even it doesn't have to be increasing your one rep max. It could be you did a set of nine with 70 kilos last week and this week you did a set of 10 with 70 kilos or you did set three sets of eight with 60 kilos. This week you did three sets of nine. We did four sets of eight. You know, you just you're just doing more each time and all of that will add up so quickly. Imagine if you did one extra rep every week on an exercise after six weeks you've done six more reps on that exercise your one rep max will have gone way up um, so being concerned about a particular movement or not progressing every single week is a quick way to be disappointed with yourself and a lot of the movements particularly as we discussed Larita the overhead pressing movements they are very slow to progress but just hang in there um, and focus on making volume progress and you will see the weight progress come also, remember, there is a trade-off between fat gain and muscle gain. So the more, the higher your calories are, yes, the faster you'll progress. But there will be a point where you're just gaining so much fat that it's not even worth the level of progress that you're getting. Um, so it's something to bear in mind. And this is actually a graph for men. So this is uh, how many years of proper training you've been doing and how much muscle you can gain per year. And this also flies in the face of people that are like, oh, I'm worried about getting too muscly. It's like, look, you'll be gaining maximum two pounds a month, you know, 100 grams a week or something. And that's if you're doing everything right, eating a calorie surplus and everything. But if not, then it's really not, nothing to worry about getting too big too quickly. Now, these numbers, unfortunately, Larita, they are divided by two for women, half for women. So... If you've been training for two years and you're gaining a pound a month um, of muscle for a man, for a woman, 
you can you're gaining half a pound a month, which is equivalent to eight ounces, two hundred grams a month. Now you can try and Jimmy, what's it called? Jimmy it, crowbar the, the process and just pound, pound the calories in. But all that's going to happen is you gain a lot more fat. Yes, you'll be at the top end of that muscle gain, but you're not going to be able to accelerate it anymore unless you start taking steroids or something. So, um, Hazel says, I don't know how to increase calories correctly. I've just joined, lots to do and set goals tonight, doing housework at the moment. Excellent. I like the multitasking, Hazel. Yeah, run through the goals process. Anyone who's done that has made such good progress across the, the six month period or the three month, um, the the 90 day um, checkpoints and, and then the three year goal process. So go into the members area, check that out, run through the process. It's a PDF sheet that you can either print off and write into, and it just sets you clear targets and daily actions that you need to do to start moving towards your weekly checkpoints, your three monthly goals, and then your three year vision. And it's, it divides your life into body, being, balance, and business. So the four quadrants of your life and everyone that's done it has absolutely surpassed their goals and just moved forward multidimensionally as a person. And it's fantastic. So yeah, highly recommended Hazel. Right. Next question. Greg asked, is Johnny going back on the coffee? Why? And has use of testosterone gone through the roof? Right. And I think I need to explain what's going on there. So for anyone that hasn't followed the podcasts, I've been doing a estrogen experiment, which is removing a lot of the environmental exposure to estrogen. So plastics, um, detergents, cosmetics, that kind of thing for 90 days. And I've taken a male hormone blood test before, and I'm going to take one afterwards. I'm about halfway through right now. So we're going to see whether there is any improvement in the hormones. I did find when I started that my testosterone was slightly down uh, below the, the clinical reference range, which is scary because the reference range is designed for like everyone from like the 20 year old man to the 80 year old unwell man. So if it's below that, something really wrong there. So I'd like to see whether reducing the environmental impact of estrogen has any effect on blood hormones over that kind of period. So I'll give you an update. I've done a podcast on this that goes into more depth and also interviewed the guy who wrote Easter Generation um, called Anthony J. He's a biochemist and he's a really, really smart guy. Um, so you can check that out. Um, I think that's coming out in the next few days, but the one that is out now is this. So I will post the link. So that is estrogen. Um, as for do I like do I feel any different? Not really, um, but I've taken measurements, photos, weight, all that stuff that I recommend you guys to do, and so we'll see whether that makes any difference. Um, I'm using things like this. This is some kind of organic vegan deodorant thing um, made from products that are all natural supposedly, but don't have. Um, don't have the kind of the estrogenic effects. So there's been a quite a few substitutions. I've had to use um, e-cover detergent and um, I'm sh my shower gel now is just the e-cover washing up liquid. Like it's a bit inconvenient, but we'll see how things go. The other question that he asked about Johnny and saying, is Johnny back on the caffeine? Um, so yeah, he has, after I continually berated him about being so addicted to coffee. I said, look, try just having no coffee for 30 days, <clears throat> reset your sensitivity to caffeine. You'll sleep better. You'll recover better. You'll be less stressed. And then you will own caffeine rather than it owning you. You'll be able to wake up in the morning. And then if you choose to have a coffee rather than being ob obliged to have one, then you'll really feel it. And you'll get much more of a, a benefit than if you were to just have this kind of build up tolerance and withdrawal effect from caffeine. So if you want to hear more on that, click on this, the caffeine lowdown, and we have a nice podcast on that too. Final question from Chinzia is, how do you prevent spinal subluxations? I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, good question, Chinzia, because this, if you haven't heard the term subluxation, it's what chiropractors tell you when they assess you, they go, ooh, you've got a lot of 
subluxations in your spine. I think we need to click your spine and, and sort these things out. Now, <clears throat> some chiropractors are good because they recognize the limits of their, of their study, of their approach. Now, others are very much have the same mindset as surgeons where everything is a nail and they are a hammer. And I've heard chiropractors make claims about the immune system being out of whack because of a spinal subluxation, which is just where the vertebra they claim are slightly misaligned. And then you have to click them back into place and that's what causes the noise. And what this is called is structuralism. So it's an excessive preoccupation with biomechanical bogeymen and there's been a few people that posted in the group over the last few days saying they've just seen an osteopath or they've seen a physio and they were talking about their hip being out of alignment and all this stuff and that's been made into the reason for their pain which may be the case but also you have to remember that these modalities look at the structure and then they blame any possible problem on the structure and we need to remember that um this is sometimes overanalyzing normal structural phenomena. We are not supposed to be 100% symmetrical. As people, we have our quirks, we have our asymmetries, and our body has adapted to them from birth. And so they won't always cause us pain, but if you go looking for asymmetries, you will find some, regardless of whether the person, the patient is symptomatic or not. Things like MRI. If you MRI, if you do a, a spinal scan of... 100 people, 50 of them will have some spinal abnormality. They'll have disc bulges, um, spondylolisthesis, so movement of the, the, the vertebra over each other, spondylolysis, like all of these kind of um, structural problems with the spine, but they won't be in any pain. They'll be pain-free. Equally, you can see people that are in a lot of pain, you scan them, and there's not really much to see on the scan, like the their spine looks anatomically normal, looks fine. So pain doesn't always correlate with structure and with abnormalities. Also, many people have leg length discrepancies. Often it's two millimeters, three millimeters, and it doesn't make, doesn't cause them a problem. They have no limp, they have no asymmetric gait because their body has adapted to it. It's maybe tightened the muscles on the le on the long side and shortened the muscles on the, um, and loosened the muscles on the short side or whatever, so that your body can adapt normally and we are adaptation machines so we can handle a lot things like scapular tracking as well you know putting your hands over your head and seeing the ways that your scapula move they won't always be perfectly symmetrical but that doesn't mean that you're going to be in pain so a really good point from paul ingram he said this people who have terrible body pain problems often have perfect posture good good ergonomics and healthy joints bodies that are basically in great condition Meanwhile, many people with perfectly obvious biomechanical problems, everything from significant scoliosis, so a lateral curvature of the spine, to obesity, are doing just fine, thank you very much. So for instance, a 2012 study clearly showed that severity of pain did not match with the severity of degeneration in the spine. This inconsistency is so glaring that it's puzzling that so many professionals seem to ignore it. Why? How can they miss that? Simple. Unfortunately, it pays to miss it. It pays to pathologize. It pays to label. So check out that article if you're interested in that, and um, then you can start to make your own judgment call as to whether the claim of subluxations is is good or not, or is is valid, credible. Um, the frequent clicking, if something is so, the supposedly, at least from what we know, clicking in joints comes from nitrogen bubbles being um, released, or um, it could just be the mechanical sound of of uh, structures moving over the, move, moving over each other, but it is an effect rather than the cause of your problems. So, let's say you have a neck that always clicks, and it could be because if it always clicks on one side, maybe the muscles on that side are tighter, and they're just pulling the joints together slightly more. The articular facets might just be pushed together. And then when, because the muscles are tight, occasionally when you click them, you're just moving the, the joint apart again, and it has that moment of relief. And then over time, the muscles get tight again. That could be because of the length tension relationship in your muscle. Maybe you sleep on that side all the time. Maybe you always are on your phone and you, you rest it like that. Whatever it is, it could be that um, you always 
walk slightly you you always carry a bag on one side whatever it is that there'll be some effect on your joints that is maybe from the muscle length tension length tension relationship so it's important to look at your habits and how you move as a whole the the autonomic nervous system story so i went to a chiropractic seminar a few years ago when i was seeing a chiropractor frequently and they were rinsing me for cash like 25 pounds a session you'd come in you'd be in there for 30 seconds they had a conveyor belt of patients they had four beds and you'd lie down on one of the beds chiropractor would come along click 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 right off you go next one on and it was unbelievable how they they were just printing money i saw no improvement um and they they obviously try and blind you with a lot of statistics and um scan they they x-ray you unnecessarily and they, they do postural analysis and all this stuff but really there was no improvement in the symptom that i came to be helped for now when i went to this seminar they said and i quote 70 percent of the nervous system is autonomic so it's it's processes that are going on automatically regulating digestion and immune response and all that stuff and therefore you when you have a subluxation in the spine a nerve has to be more than 70 percent compressed to become symptomatic to become conscious what kind of logical jump is that to say that um you have to be compressing a nerve 70 percent before you even notice that that's the case as if like the whole of the nervous system the autonomic system is, is the first 70 percent and then it it, it's complete bollocks but they were relying on people's scientific illiteracy or the you know the fact that they're in a white coat and all this stuff for people to believe their claims and i thought that was pretty heinous um there is no way that even theoretically even mechanistically that that would make sense so yeah i was pretty annoyed at that um so just basically take people's take these therapists with a pinch of salt um otherwise you can end up with basically a lighter wallet and no real improvement right guys long q a today but thank you for the questions i hope that is helpful let me know in the comments if you have any other stuff any other questions otherwise i'll post a poll on tuesday and that is it for today speak soon